Wow, how's that for an intro? <laughs> Jared Mazzara. Yikes. I like that last song. It's like, you're going to hear later. That's kind of my story a little bit. But uh, have you guys known someone who tells the truth no matter what? I've got a story that really happened, and it's been the toughest part about preparing for this, whether or not to even share this story, because it shows my immense stupidity. I was like 12 or 13 years old, and I had cousins come in from about three hours away. And we had a uh, cemetery about two blocks from our house, so we got like five, five cousins together, so we go kill some time in the cemetery. There's this bluff overlooking this road. And there's a road there with kind of gravel road. So you get five teenage boys, stupider than whatever. <laughs> so we decide, wouldn't it be cool to like throw rocks down right in front of cars and then they'll bounce around and hit the cars. Well, that's bright. <laughs> so we do that a couple of times and one guy who was driving really didn't think this was a very cool thing to do. So he turns around and he decides to kind of chase us. <laughs> well, he was older, so he couldn't keep up with a bunch of teenagers. So we're outpacing him, and he's like having a heart attack or something, and he just kind of goes, in his last breath, he's like, hey, you stop! One of my idiot cousins actually stops. <laughs> and he turns back, and he rats us all out, and we all get in trouble. So I'm going, not really a great time for honesty. But, you know, sometimes, well, honesty is always the best policy, but sometimes it's, you gotta massage honesty. You know, what do you, what do, you do when your best friend comes to you and has just a horrible new haircut? You really don't wanna be honest. But if your mom makes a dinner that really was terrible, honesty might not be the best thing. You tell her? How about a teacher ask you how, how studying went last night? Did you study hard for this quiz? Or, you fib a little bit, you know? I mean, they know, but you still don't want to tell them. So, honesty in church is also kind of tough as well. And one thing I think that most people are dishonest about is doubt. How many people here doubt, whether it's doubt God a little bit, doubt the church? I'm going to give you a secret. Everybody doubts. Everybody doubts. It's okay. The, the issue is going to be how do we work through our doubts? So we've got some verses here. Oh, I like that one. Let's go to that verse. That's another verse. So I'm going to be all over the place. So mm -hmm. I'm going to challenge. That's okay. I like that one. So really, okay, yeah. So, so doubt is there's two little things that I picked up that these are not mine, I just heard them someplace. The absence of certainty is, is doubt. So it's really hard to be certain about God when he's like got infinite wisdom and we're, you know, big God, puny me. We're like really, really stupid when it comes to things of God. We can't know God's brain. So that's gonna lead to doubt. The other one was the, okay, yeah. Doubt is not a Christian thing. Doubt is a human condition. We, based on our limited minds and unknowable answers about the world around us. Muslims have doubt. Vegans have doubt. <laughs> not that vegans and Muslims are the same thing. I mean, everyone has doubt. You have doubt about things that you don't understand. So, so the idea is, doubt's okay. We're going to talk about how to work through it. But to make you feel a little bit better about doubt and that other people deal with doubt, so Matthew 14, 25 through 31. It's a story about, about Jesus walking on water. Peter comes out. Peter asks him, can I come out to you? Let's see. Let's pick it up at 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. 
And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you, li you of little faith, why did you doubt? And think about that. I mean, here Jesus walks on the water. Peter walks on the water. Yet he still doubts. By this time, Peter had witnessed many healings. Jesus calming a storm. Sending demons into a herd of pigs. Healing a blind man. Feeding 5,000. Jesus walking on water, him walking on, on water, and he still doubted. It's kind of crazy to me. In Matthew 28, 16, and 17, now this one just freaks me out. I never even picked this up until I started studying this. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So this was just the 11 disciples, Jesus is crucified, he's resurrected, they go to Galilee, the 11 of them. They just got done spending three years with him, seeing everything he's ever done. They see him, the resurrected Jesus, but some doubted. Makes me feel a little bit better when I have a little instance of doubt. I mean, that's just, that's crazy to me. Then you've got the uh, Luke 24, 36 through 38. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? So again, the resurrected Jesus visits them in the upper room behind a locked door. But they still doubt. And then one last one, the story of Lazarus. Lazarus is dead for four days. Jesus raises him to life. And then, then it says, many of the Jews had seen what Jesus did and put their faith in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees. So even after seeing Lazarus raised from the dead, a man who'd been dead for four, four days, some people still doubted and, and went to the Pharisees. So, if you don't get from all these things, doubt happens. It's nothing we need to, to, to feel bad about. It's nothing that we need to sit there and be embarrassed about. It's nothing we need to hide. So the neat thing about it is if you look at Peter, not only did he doubt Jesus when he was walking on the water, he denied him three times, which is a pretty big form of doubt. After all that, Jesus still loved him. The disciples doubted, and Jesus still loved him. Thomas, and we all know the story of doubting Thomas, he doubted, Jesus still loved him. So, it's not like Jesus is going to go, uh, Jim, you doubted me once too often, you're out, you're going to forget him. So it's, it's, it's something he can deal with. So why does, why does doubt happen? And, it, and again, it's, 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 it's a natural thing. It happens because our finite minds just can't comprehend all the things of God. Uh, one of the things also, I think, it's sometimes it's, it's, it's going to be a lack of proximity. It's, a, you know, you hear it a hundred times here, abiding in Christ, abiding in Christ. Lack of proximity is going to put us in a position to, to not trust God as much. I think there's another reason, and in some of it I'm going to tell you my, my story, my testimony. And I'm lucky because of the way I came to Christ. I, I lived 34 years of my life pretty much totally away from Christ. I was, um, I was pretty successful. I sold commercial real estate. I'm in my early 30s, I'm making a lot of money. I'm driving nice cars. I'm living in nice houses. This is going to blow your mind. I swear this is true, I dated really beautiful girls. <laughs> it was a long time ago, I had hair the whole bit. Okay. But then God started really pursuing me. 
And, and he, I mean, he pursued me through people. He pursued me through books, music, just every time I turned around, God is slapping me upside the head, kind of going, time to make a decision. So it was funny. I, I go to a buddy, I'm playing golf with a buddy of mine, I knew he was a Christian, and he said, and I, and I go, hey, can I go to church with you on Sunday? And he says, no. Now let's, let's have lunch first. That's the guy listening to the Holy Spirit, because where I was at, growing up Catholic and all that, if I would have gone to a, a church and seen someone raising their hands, I would have just run and never come back. So we had lunch, we talked, and man, after, I mean, after seeing God pursue me the way he did, I was in. I was like zero to a hundred in no time at all. And it's, and it's, he was so real to me because he pursued me so much. And I wonder with a lot of young people, maybe a lot of you with your story is, you've been in church so long, is it, is it your parents' faith more than it's yours? Has, has God beat you upside the head? Have you seen him face to face the way that I did? And, and if not, I mean, I think that's one thing to really consider at this point, you know, at some point tonight. Um, I think, uh, hang on a second. So one, one of the big things in this lesson that they, oh wait, by the way, I, I, if, you, if you see Virgil like stand up, I, I asked him to have a mic. So if I like really mess something up or if I like leave a big gap, he can just, so he's not being rude or interruptive or anything like that. Jim's not uh, messing up at all. But I did want to throw in about that proximity thing. Who all knows what the word proximity means? Okay, so you don't. The thing is, it's another word for a close relationship with. So the thing is, uh, the first time you meet somebody, do you trust them? We might trust them not to, hit us upside the head, but the thing is, uh, I'll stand up so it's not weird to be turned around, but the thing is, uh, when you grow in a relationship with them, so like when Daniel and I first met, he's like, okay, who is this bald guy? Uh, because they're used to, I used to shave my head and I didn't have the goatee or anything, so I looked like a mini Buddha. <laughs> right? But yeah, I, I, really, I really did. Uh, but the thing is, it's like, okay, cool, this is a cool guy. He, He's awesome, you know, like he was wearing skinny jeans, I think, at the time, and I was wearing baggier ones because, again, I'm Buddha, he's not. Uh, so, uh, it's one of those things, like, okay, this is a kind of cool guy. But the thing is, over the last, what is it, coming up on four years? Four years. Uh, Daniel and I have been working together, we've been through a journey together. I trust him impeccably. I trust him with my family. I trust him with my kids. I trust him with my wife to take care of them. If something, if I got like, stuck in... Tanzania, I'd be like, Daniel, can you take care of him? And he would. Why we have a close proximity. So when it comes down to Christ, where is it? Where's your relationship with him? Is it where it's just you meet him on Sundays and you shake his hand and say, good to see you, Jesus, today? Or is it where you spend time with him, building that close relationship? And that takes time. And I want to throw this one out there. Sorry, I'm not trying to steal your thunder. Do it. But we all talk about our faith, right? Dap is really the fuel for our faith. Because when we allow our doubt to be given to God, He can set that on fire and bring something out of that. And that's what builds that faith. It's when we're honest with Him and saying, God, I'm doubting right now. This is hard. It's okay to say, God, I don't know if you're really there. He's not going to be shaking. He actually gets excited. Why? Because you're talking to Him. That's a relationship. Now, if you're just talking to Facebook, that's not a relationship with God. But if you're talking to God saying, I don't know if you're there, God. He gets excited. Why? You're bringing your doubt to him. And that's going to be fuel for your faith. Yep. So one of the great lines from this uh, little outline was, don't let your doubt keep you out. So understand doubt's okay. Work through it. How do you work through it? One of the big ways is, Make a list of the things that God has done in your life. And, you know, a lot of us might not have things that we can really point to. 
what God's done in your life. And I, I would encourage you to just listen to the Holy Spirit. Now that's sometimes hard. I know I always used to say, I, I wish the Holy Spirit would speak to me in an accent so I could tell his voice from my voice because a lot of times it's, it sounds really similar. In fact, back in 2005, I was really convinced that God told me I needed to run for Congress in Illinois. Yeah. And I prayed about it, and I prayed about it, and it, it didn't go away. And I didn't know if it was my voice or his, but it wouldn't go away, so I can be an idiot for God, so I ran for Congress. And I mean, it cost me a ton of time. It cost me a lot of lost income. At the end, we put money into the campaign to keep it going and to try and win and I lost by 220 votes. And I'm sitting there going, well, God, I kind of thought this was your deal. Maybe I misread the whole deal. But like the day after the election, man, we got hundreds of emails just from people saying, man, how cool the way you ran. I mean, I was out there with my faith. I was out there with pro-life. I didn't duck anything. And, and people would send an email saying how much that meant to them to see. And that, that really helped me through the whole thing. Still kind of was going on. I still don't get it, 220 votes. I mean, and then there was a guy that lived about 150 miles away in, in the district, and he helped me out with the campaign in his area. And a couple few months later, he sits there and tells me, because of the way that you ran your campaign, I've reconnected with God. And my wife, who to this day will still bring up the campaign and what a shame we lost and the money and all this stuff, I'm going, if all of that was just for this one guy reconnecting with Christ, it's okay. I mean, we'll, we'll take it. Number one, that really, and it, it hit me again this last weekend because in the in church, we were talking about uh, where your treasure, uh, Nate was talking about where your treasure is, your heart will follow. And my church up north was big on world missions. And I'm over at the pastor's house at a home group once, and there she's talking about it, the pastor's wife's talking about it, and I go, I, I just don't really go for world missions. I'm a, I kind of think local missions, there's a lot of needs locally, I'd rather have my time and money go there. She said, just give a little bit where your treasure is, your heart will follow. Well, six trips to Africa and one trip to Northeast India, I listened to God, and I tell you what, amazing, amazing to be used by God in ways like that. And I think, is there the Facebook thing up there, Kendall? I've got, to this day, I keep in touch with with some people from Africa and a couple from India. This is Matruda, her Facebook page. Her name is, she's changed her name to Matruda Destiny Moen Chitinge. I met her when she was seven years old in 2000. And if you can see in the one, she actually lists family. And in her family, she lists me as her father. I'm not really certain why. But it's like this little piece of obedience to the Holy Spirit has, has a girl in Africa calling me her father, and we communicate, and, and it's, you know, it's got this faith relationship. And I've said it for years. I am convinced that I'm going to be in heaven one day, and I'm going to have some African kids coming up to me and say, I'm here because... And this actually gets me emo emotional. I am here because you went and you met my great, great, great grandmother and you changed my life. And that's just, that's here to me, that's hearing the Holy Spirit and just obeying. So I, I just, I want to encourage you that when you hear that voice and it says, go talk to that person, let's go do this, obey it. If it's your voice, whatever, it'll go. But it's very likely the Holy Spirit, and he can change your life, and he can change someone else's life. I think the other way to really kind of 
not let your doubts keep you out is through prayer. You know, like Virgil said, just be honest with God. I've got a doubt. Help me through this. I mean, I can think of two things in my life where prayer was obviously answered. About 20 years ago, I remember laying in bed going, God, I want you to be the last thing I think about before I fall asleep, and I want you to be the first thing I think about when I wake up. And I'm telling you, 20 years later, I can't remember a night that I went to bed that I didn't think about him as the last thing as, as I fell asleep, and every morning he's the first thing I wake up. And I tell you, that is not of me. I am way too self-centered, I'm way too shallow to do that. That's totally the Holy Spirit. I just, I asked him and he did it. Back 20 plus years ago, we started a commercial real estate company. There was five of us. And so we all left our, our companies. We started this firm on our own. Six months later, two of the people kind of got, eh, I don't want to be part of this thing. So they bugged out, left three of us. It's a significant financial concern. I'm sitting there going, I'm freaking out the rest of that day and I'm laying in bed that night going, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do now? And I prayed to God and I said, I, I don't wanna be bothered with this. Can you take this off my mind and let me sleep and let me wake up and never think about it again? And I went to sleep, slept like a baby, never thought about the consequences, the financial consequences of it again. So, God answers prayer. I had a little doubt about finances. He took it away because I prayed about it. I mean, so I would encourage you. You got issues, go to him, pray about it. He's going to help you out through it. Now, the other one, he, one of the things that they say in this is be patient. And Virgil might want to add something to this when I'm, when I'm through, through with that is I'd say, I don't know about what we think about is patience, and this is where Virgil can step in maybe if he wants. But to me, I think patience is, it's okay, I don't see God happening. And I go, I'd say, don't be patient. Be reckless. Go out there. Do stuff for God. You know, go out and chase him. Be an idiot for God. Listen to his voice and obey it. Um, you know, I don't, it doesn't have to be a run for Congress. It doesn't have to be going to Africa. But it's if he says, talk to someone, go talk to him. Try and be active for God and see what he does. Make where, you know, where, where number one says is, is kind of remember, make a list of, of times when God, or make a list of times when you, you see God working and when he's, he's worked in your life. Go make those things. Give him the opportunity by listening to him. Um, Real quick on the patient. You're like, well, it says in the Bible that you should be patient. Uh, if you look up the Greek word in a few places where it says patient, it can mean to remain, and it can mean as well to abide. So those are active things that you can do. It's not, uh, have you ever heard that song, Case or Off or Off? Have you ever heard that phrase before? Do you know what that phrase means? Your grandparents don't want to. Uh, it means what will be, will be. That's, that's not what patience is. And that's what Jim's talking about is we need to define patience by what it actually says in the Bible. And what that is, it's active. It's saying, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to stay persistent in my relationship with God until he speaks. And then I'm going to do what he asked me to speak. And that's what patience is. It's not just, oh, what will be, will be. That's not active faith. I was thinking, I would encourage you guys to, if, if y'all don't have a real paper Bible, get one. If you have one and use your device, man, use one of these. This is awesome. Because I want to read something out of Philippians, which I, I think kind of goes with some of this. Sorry, I'm old. So in Philippians 3.12, it says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which, for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting 
what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And in my Bible, that's all highlighted. And in red, I have press on to take hold, straining, that's all circled in red, and press on again, press on, press on, straining. And I would, I would venture to guess, myself included, we all don't strain. We don't press on enough to be close to Christ. I, the, other, the only other thing I'd say is, is, is it's, in our world today, it's real easy to just get caught up in worldly stuff. And the world is turning stupider and stupider all the time. You're going to school, you're dealing with more and more crap that isn't godly every day. Can I say crap? <laughs> so, I, mean, I, I would encourage you to. I got a pastor front up north. He uh, used to be a, a music pastor, and he said, you know, music was never been saved. You can have some really good songs that aren't Christian songs that are really solid, but boy, I'd watch it. I mean, I would, I would challenge you to. Man, we listen to Christian music way more than contemporary music. And I'd say, watch what you watch on TV. Surround yourself with godly friends. Don't insulate yourself, but, but protect yourself. So in closing, I would just, I would just encourage you to, to be aggressive for God. Be willing to be an idiot for God. I'm good at that. You know, try and really pay attention to proximity. Challenge yourself to spend time in the Word. I'd say challenge yourself to get and use your paper Bible. Get a highlighter. Get a red pen. Make notes to yourself. There's nothing that makes me feel better that I turn a page and I see notes from Zambia. That's the coolest thing. Or, or if you make a note that you were studying this with whomever, make notes about who you studied something with. You know, so-and-so said this. It's okay to write in your Bible. It's the coolest thing to sit there, you know, five years later, 10 years later to see a note. So I'm gonna ask the worship team to come back up. I just, I went nuts when Eric played I Surrender last week, and I'm just going, I really want to close this with I Surrender, because I want to challenge you guys to, you know, let's take the next step. Let's be active for God. Let's create the opportunities that we can grab onto, and any time we have doubt, we can go, no, I'm not going to doubt, because, man, I know what God's done for me in the past. So I just want to pray us out, and, and then we'll let these guys sing. Father God, I just, I thank you for this time. I thank you for, for the opportunity to, to, to share stories about what you've done in my life and how real you've been and how you've uh, just made so many moments for me. And I pray, Lord, for all of us that, that we can take this message that you've provided and make it our own and, and to really take that next step for you to really challenge ourselves to grow closer to you to to live in, in more proximity closer proximity to you every day Lord. Lord, I just uh, again I just I want to pray for Andrew and Allie and all their going through I just ask your blessing on their lives right now Lord. Father we thank you